Okay, um, thanks to the organizers for um, hosting this stimulating and um, uh, lovely conference. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some work with um, these collection of people from UCLA. This is um, mostly on graduate students, except um, colleague Eric Doker. So some combination of papers that have appeared and, and are to appear. Uh, the general theme here is discussing um, aspects of the ADS-3 CFT2 correspondence. So this ties in to um, the last talk we just heard. Um, and of course, when you talk about gravity in, in ADS-3, you should ask this question, like, why is this um, an interesting thing to do? Um, in particular, we're trying to use this as a laboratory or toy model to eventually, hopefully, study some universal properties of gravity. We can address, hopefully address the big questions of black hole information and so on. And the question is always whether you know, ADS-3 is too simple. Um, and of course, um, pure gravity in ADS-3 is a topological theory, and the propagating degrees of freedom, so that's very different. Um, other hand, I'll be um, introducing matter here. And you know, ADS-3 gravity with matter is really not so different in many ways from higher dimensional case. Um, you, know, you can form black holes, there's an information paradox, and it's a non-renormalizable theory and so on. So we can, we can be optimistic and hope we'll learn some general features. Okay, and, and of course, a big role um, is played by the fact that we have this enhanced symmetry in ADS-3, the Virasora algebra, and this uh, is, is something I'll be using heavily here. And a lot of this um, work these days is sort of done in the context of um, conformal bootstrap program, talking about conformal blocks and Virasora blocks, and that'll um, be present here as well. And um, again, this is the, the reason for focusing on this is it helps us learn about general aspects of um, gravity be true for any, any theory of gravity in ADS-3. Okay, so let me start by motivation. Let me, let me, let me start with a, posing a problem. Um, let me ask the question, how would you think about computing the uh, gravitational self-energy of a particle? Um, well, we could just ask this question any dimension. Um, now, if, you were to, if someone asked you what is the gravitational self-energy of a point particle, in general, the correct answer is uh, infinite mass renormalization, and so it's cutoff dependent, so on. So that's not a very physical, um, interesting question. But um, the situation is a lot more favorable in ADS-3. This is, of course, tied to the fact that there are no local degrees of freedom. And so let me, let me give a sort of a heuristic um, argument for the first term in, in such a um, self-energy correction, then we'll go on to study this more systematically. Okay, so let me, I want to think about some um, point particle, and essentially what I want to do is ask, um, you know, close by, close by, it's effectively flat space, and I know if I have a particle in, in flat space gravity, um, there's a conical um, deficit produced that's given by this formula, it raises the mass of the particle to the conical um, deficit. Now, um, so that's, that defines sort of the, the, the bare mass of the local mass, and now this particle, I'm, I'm sitting there in ADS-3, and so what I can do is I can look for the asymptotically ADS-3 metric that has that same conical deficit, okay? Because that's conical deficit, what pair much is the bare mass. So this is the um, metric as a function of the mass at infinity, and there's this relation. I mean, just go and find the deficit angle here from just looking near the origin. And there's this relation between the deficit angle and the mass. Okay, and so if I equate this um, deficit angle to that deficit angle, this gives me a relationship between the asymptotic mass and the bare mass. Okay, so I get this in this quadratic term here, which is the um, correction due to interaction. This is all a classical calculation at this point, of course. Let me rewrite this in terms of the brown hino formula. And then I'll write the mass in terms of the natural ground state. This is the natural uh, ground state shift in the CFT. And then the energy in terms of the conformal dimension H. And then the original mass was just the bare conformal dimension. Okay, so what I get here is a relationship between the bare conformal dimension H naught and the corrected conformal dimension H, and there's this correction here. Okay, and so you should view this calculation as being valid, first of all, in the large central charge limit. This is a classical calculation. And to get something here, I have to scale H as well. And so H and C are scaling to infinity with their, with their ratio fixed, okay? So this is the classical self-energy, and it seems to be a meaningful result. But then we could ask about what are the corrections to this, both the corrections um, in a 1 over C expansion and corrections at subleading order in H. Okay, so um, 
Now, if we're doing this from the point of view of ADS-CFT, the way we might think about computing such a thing is I could compute the um, boundary two-point function of the corresponding operator, and it would have the standard form of CFT, and then I would try to read off the conformal dimension from that exponent. And a calculation like this done in the bulk would be some loop expansion, so I'd have the bare propagator and then various graviton corrections. I'm only looking at um, corrections due to gravity here. Okay, and so now, yeah, I might ask, what would these things sum up to if I could compute these things? And um, in fact, there is a natural expectation for what the exact answer should be. And so to motivate that, let's recall that um, in ADS-3, if you turn off gravity, you just have the symmetry of the theory is just the isometry group of ADS-3, which is SL2 times SL2. So when you turn on gravity, you're essentially enhancing SL2 to the Virasor algebra. And so from the point of view of these representations, when we turn on gravity, we're, we're sort of taking a representation of SL2 and um, extending it to a representation of Virasor. And now let me, from the CFT point of view, there is a natural way to do this. That, and, and there are various ways to think about this. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna actually quickly review here something that was a way that was approached by uh, Bershadsky and Orguri. And um, th there's way too many formulas on this slide. I apologize for that. I'm not gonna go through all the details here, but um, I will say a few things. So again, the, the question is, so it's a conformal field theory question. The question is if I have an SL2 theory, by which I actually mean uh, theory with SL2 current algebra, and I have some state representation in that theory. How can I relate that theory to a theory with Virasoro algebra and then relate representations? And you'll see this is the same kind of question I was asking about the gravitational self-energy. Okay, so um, okay, just yeah, going very quickly. So this is, this is the SL2 current algebra. There's some Sugawara tensor, some central charge, and primaries are labeled by some spin J. And spin J here doesn't actually, the J doesn't have to be an integer or even positive, uh, it can be anything here. Okay, so now um, the way you get to uh, Virasoro is you impose constraints. And this is, this is related to what you do in, in the bulk, sort of tied into what, Virus, what uh, Hollinger was talking about. If you impose in the bulk some asymptotically ADS3 boundary conditions, this is, the, this is the CFT analog of that. So you impose some, you impose some constraints on the currents like this, and um, the, the idea will be after you compose these constraints, the, the remaining symmetry will be Virasoro. Okay, so now, okay, again, flashing way too quickly, but you have to, to do this, you have to modify the stress tensor because this is not a conformally invariant constraint unless you modify the stress tensor. And you impose constraints, you need some ghosts, and you get a new central charge. And due to this new stress tensor, the original um, primaries now pick up some new dimension because you modified the stress tensor. And there's some new central charge built out of this, out of this um, new stress tensor. And okay, you put it all together, and what you eventually end up with here is a formula for the conformal dimension of the Virasor representation in terms of the spin J of the SL2 representation, and there's some expansion here, and you can just put these formulas together here and, and work out this expansion to all orders, okay? So um, to compare this to the previous formula, I wanna identify this leading term here with the bare dimension, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna identify H naught with, with minus J here. And then um, the second term here, if I, cross off the plus one, then you can see the 6j squared over c is precisely this term here. And now I'm getting this infinite series of corrections, both corrections due to j squared being replaced by j, j plus one, that's like um, corrections due to the point particle limit, and then there's an infinite series in one over c that should be gravitational corrections, okay? So, um, so this is the expectation for the result that, well, it's an expectation. Okay, so, um, now you could try to calculate this in the bulk by doing Feynman diagrams, just computing all those diagrams. It's of course um, quite difficult, um, especially if you do it in a covariant gauge. Now, if you were, so let me motivate way to do this more simply. So if you were to compute this at leading order, just in the classical theory, you know the two point function is just given by the exponential of the geodesic length in the bulk. So one way of thinking what you want to do is you want to take like this formula and you essentially want to quantize that geodesic length formula. Okay, you want to quantize the length formula, that's quantizing the, the metric. And um, again, that would be a difficult thing to do in general, but in, in ADS-3, um, due to this lack of local degrees of freedom, this is much more tractable. In particular, the full phase space of 3D gravity is known, so this is the general asymptotically ADS-3 metric, sometimes called the Bignados metric. And so the, the free, there are free functions here, T of Z, T bar of Z bar, which are in fact identified with the CFT stress tensor. 
So essentially to quantize 3D gravity, you want to be quantizing T and T bar. And that, of course, gives us a close relation to what happens in the CFT. Okay, and this way of thinking about things has actually appeared in a number of papers. Well, there's a whole series of here's by Fitzpatrick and Kaplan, which is underlying a lot of this stuff. I'm not going to mention it all the times, but there are many interesting things in their papers. Also, Tom Hartman and collaborators have some things related to this. Um, in any case, um, so we like to then, if we view this now as an operator, T and T bar think of these as operators, that promotes the length to an operator. And now we can try to make sense of this formula, taking the expectation value of this e to the minus uh, length, think of this length as an operator, and try to extract a dimension like this. Okay, and the, the claim is this is a more efficient way of, of essentially computing uh, Feynman diagrams. Okay, now to connect this with, to what Alejandro is talking about, we're going to go, go further and, and you do this in a Wilson line framework. And one way to think about this is we'd like to take this expression and we'd like to factorize this. We'd like to holomorphically factorize it. And we can do that using pre precisely one of these Wilson line observables that, um, that was mentioned. And, and, and well, you heard about that. Um, I was actually counting on Alejandra to talk more about the Wilson lines, and she was counting on me to talk about it. So, but, um, I'm not going to go into the <laughs> derivation of this, but um, in any case, so what appears here, A, is in um, an SL2 connection. So L1, L0, and L minus 1 are SL2 generators. They are actually logically separate from the stress tensor. The T of Z is the stress tensor of a CFT. Its modes are not L0, L1, and L minus 1. Okay, there's a two logically independent, um, independent things here. And um, you take this um, object, this path ordered exponential, between some states, some appropriately highest weight and lowest weight states, and square this guy. And um, the claim is you can just check this. Um, so justification for the statement is you can do this for any, uh, for any metric with a arbitrary um, classical T of Z and plug in and you'll get back this expression. So an arbitrary point in that phase space, this does reproduce that geodesic length expression. So just by direct calculation, you see this is, this is a true statement. Okay, but now this holomorphic factorization is a, is a big technical advantage. Okay, so, um, so now we'd like to compute the expectation value of this guy, again, viewing T of Z as an operator. And so now it's kind of clear in principle what we should do, because you can take this exponential, expand it in powers of T of Z, and then you take the expectation value, and then we have to do is take expectation values of strings of T of Z, but we know those are universal CFD objects. We know how to write those down. And um, then you have to, of course, do the integrals. And that's actually pretty complicated because there's these, this path ordering, so there's a big series of, of nested integrals, and that's, of course, where all the technical fun begins. Um, okay, now, now apart from the way I motivate this nervous self-energy, this object is actually a very basic CFT object. So this um, expression here, now viewed as something built out of the stress tensor, so built as, as something built out of integrals of the stress tensor, is expected to be um, the so-called Vera Soro vacuum OPE block. So that, that is defined as, as follows. So if you take two, in a 2D CFT, you take two primary operators and take their OPE. Of course, you get a whole bunch of stuff. But if you collect everything that just, that just has stress tensors and no other operators in it, that, um, that object is, is called the Vera Soro vacuum OPE block. Okay? And it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's really a fundamental um, object in, um, in CFT. And, um, so, and the claim is that this is equal to, equal to that. And what's happening here is that it's packaging, this Wilson line is packaging this object in a form that's convenient for expansion in, in 1 over C, which is, again, the bulk perturbative expansion. OK, so we want to take the expectation value of this guy in, in the CFT. So we take our path order exponential, and we, we compute it. And in principle, what we should be doing is we should get an answer of this form where h, the conformal dimension, should have a series in 1 over c, like this. And so if we actually expanded this, of course, we'll get a bunch of logs. You get logs, you know, anomalous dimensions are associated with logs. And so we compute, we, if we compute this perturbatively, we should identify, we should find the logs. And then from that, we try to read off the conformal dimensions. And this is the answer we expect from, um, for, from that uh, Bershadsky or, or Guri argument. OK, and again, if you try to do this and just write things out, then you get this infinite series of of nested integrals, of correlators, of, of stress tensors, and, and we can think about computing this order by order one over C. And again, what we're doing in the bulk really is computing this series of, of diagrams. Okay, so first of all, the, one, the leading order, just like the one loop contribution, 
just write out those integrals. Here's what you get. Um, and uh, now this is a divergent integral. So there's this term of the denominator here. And that divergence is just when these two vertices collide. That's just coming from the divergence of the two-point function. And, and what we did, first of all, just regulate this way, regulate this in the silliest way possible, just introduce a little epsilon squared here. And then you can evaluate the integrals and you get some divergences, some power law divergences we just cross out. There's some constant term here, which we just absorb in the normalization. And what remains here is this log term. And when you put that in, indeed, that is the correct log term to give the anomalous dimension, okay? So from this point of view, we reproduce that, um, that correct anomalous dimension at this order. Now, if you go to the next order, where you have these two loop diagrams, if you try to put in that previous regulator, in fact, the results are um, ambiguous. And um, the form of the divergences is not so nice. I won't get into the details of that, but it's, it's ambiguous. But, um, but what these authors later on um, improved the situation. So they advocated a sort of a form of dimensional regularization where essentially you, you change the dimension of the stress tensor from two to two minus epsilon. And so you place correlators like this. And you also renormalize the um, Drusa vertex renormalization of the Wilson line. And um, you can fix everything by demanding finiteness and demanding that there's some word identity that's satisfied. And it turns out when you post those conditions, everything is just uniquely fixed. There are no free parameters. You just have to do the computation and, and get what you get. And they did that calculation, which is, it starts to get a little bit complicated. And, but indeed, you get precisely the correct answer. This 78 is precisely what you want to get. And what you might not appreciate here is when you do this calculation, there's actually just a huge number of terms. And there are many conspiracies and cancellations that have to happen to get the right result. It's not even at all clear you get like a JJ plus 1. And there's no free parameters. Everything just in some way that's still actually mysterious to us. It, it all works out. And to try to understand that mystery, we um, decided to carry this out to the next order, hoping that you know, by the time you get to three loops, you either hope that either find the conjecture is false, or you suddenly realize, aha, here's why it's working in general, and now I know how to do it all orders. Um, here, actually, the situation was in between those two, unfortunately. Um, so you do the calculation, you get the correct result. But now, there, well, there are an incredible number of, it, it's sort of remarkable the way it works, and um, because there's a huge number of cancellations and conspiracies. And it's still actually mysterious why this is working. Anyway, but the, the conjecture up to three loops seems to be correct. This is all hanging together. But um, if you ask me, how do I know it's going to work to higher orders? Um, in fact, I can't prove that. And, and the basic technical reason for this is that um, this regular we're using is, 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 is a, it's a nice regular, but it doesn't preserve all the symmetries. In particular, it doesn't preserve Verisora algebra. And um, since you're breaking some of the symmetries, that means there always going to be some sort of what appear to be miraculous cancellations that happen. So part of what's interesting about this is there's some, this is a problem with a very definite answer. And uh, it cries out for some way to do the calculation that would give that um, manifestly. And I think this would actually teach us something useful about uh, CFT and, and about, um, about 3D gravity. OK. Um, now. Um, I want to get to the next part, so I'll say this very quickly. I mean, you can generalize this from um, two-point functions to higher point functions. You can um, write down networks of these Wilson lines to compute four-point, five, six-point, whatever blocks you want. And just by putting together certain highest weight states, propagating these things into the bulk, and introducing appropriate vertices. And these generate, um, again, conformal blocks, um, global conformal blocks. If you do things at leading order in 1 over C, but then by the same ideas I just mentioned, by computing correlators of stress tensors and dress these things up, you can um, um, enhance these things to, uh, to virasoral blocks. OK, and um, furthermore, there's a natural generalization of this, of course, from SL2 to the higher spin gravity that was discussed um, previously just by literally replacing SL2 connections by SLN, and, and one could generalize this. Not everything here has been generalized, but um, certainly could be. OK. Um, all right, now the next, next topic um, that, that extends on this is the question of computing um, these conformal blocks at late times. OK, so in this case, I want to think about a, a four-point um, function. OK, so one, point, one way to compute a four-point function is um, so before I was computing this Wilson line and I was evaluating it in the CFT vacuum state. 
If I now, instead of evaluating the CFT vacuum state, I evaluate it in some non-trivial state of the CFT, some primary state, this will be computing a two-point function in that background, which is the same thing as a four-point function. So that's what I want to talk about now. So this um, state H2 is my CFT state. And um, in, in this game, you can, you can take two different limits. So we're always thinking about large C, but we could imagine computing a so-called heavy light correlator where the dimension scales like C, or a light correlator where it scales like C to the zero. And if this if operator is heavy and it's further than a greater than C over 24, then this would correspond to a, a correlation function of black hole background, which is a very interesting object. Um, so as Melissina originally pointed out, um, the late time behavior of these um, such correlators is a good probe of black hole information paradox because semi-classical gravity says the thing should, well, appears to say it would decay to zero, whereas we know unitarity of the CFT says it should stabilize at some non-zero value. Now, it's, it's, very, so it's, it's, it's very challenging to compute these correlators at late times. Um, because um, essentially what you want to do here is, um, so here's the correlator, here are the operators that I inserted in the CFT. There's one at the origin, one at infinity, that's the in and out states. And to compute a correlator late times, what you do is you have to compute the um, Wilson line and go around the branch cut many, many times. Every time you go around the branch cut, if you translate this statement onto the cylinder, you're going like once around the cylinder, once around to like a null direction around the cylinder, you're advancing. So to compute the late times, you have to go many, many times around um, the branch cut. And um, you have to do that, you want to do this actually number of times is comparable to C. And so the one over the naive one over C expansion actually breaks down because the times are of order of C. Okay, so um, doing this for the most interesting case of the heavy light correlator is so, so far has been analytically intract intractable. Um, th there's some numerical calculations for the, uh, the Virasoro block which in fact eventually showed some um, power law decay, um, but that's all numerical. So we'd like to do a situation where we can um, try to do something analytically. So I'm gonna look at the light light case, both operators are light, and so we're gonna look at this limit. Okay, large C, large time, these uh, quantities are held fixed. And, and again, this will really require us to exponentiate things, we have to resum some diagrams, and so it should hopefully be some technical advance for studying the more interesting case, although this case is already somewhat interesting. So we have to go around the branch cut um, n, n times and to advance time by two pi n. So now if you try to compute this, um, this Wilson line object, um, the thing that's very, very difficult about doing this, especially when you go around the branch cut many, many times, is this path ordering. The path ordering gives you all these nested, these nested um, integrals and they're very challenging to compute. The nice thing about late times in this particular case, where we look at the light block, is it turns out that that path ordering can be omitted, okay? So you can show that in, at late times, there is a, essentially a diffuse distribution of these stress tensors, and the path ordering only matters when two stress tensors are on the same sheet. If stress tensors are on different sheets, the relative ordering doesn't actually matter because of periodicity. So in this late time, you actually have this diffuse gas limit, and so you can just get rid of the path ordering. When you get rid of the path ordering, life is actually pretty simple. So you can, you can just do the um, calculation explicitly, you can do the um, integrals. And so just to, I'm running out of time here, so I won't say the details, but the upshot of this is, is that you just get some new simple factors inserted into this Wilson line. And what you find is the Wilson line as a function of time takes this, you can now decompose this in terms of you know, Fourier expansion on the cylinder. And, and what this calculation does, effectively it, 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 it picks up, it shifts the energies of some anomalous dimensions. Okay, which you should think of anomalous dimensions of these two particle states. I have some four point functions, I have these two particles propagating, and I'm getting some anomalous dimensions due to the gravitational interactions that I'm now gotten by essentially exponentiating the graviton exchange. And um, these anomalous dimensions are extremely simple. They're just built out of the quadratic casimirs of these representations. And that's sort of a, a nice feature that comes out of this Wilson line. So, um, so in any case, one can, one can do this calculation at late times. And then um, one can try to check this by more um, standard methods. So in particular, you can ask whether this um, result for the anomalous dimensions is actually a true statement about the gravitational interaction between two particles. And um, the answer is, is yes. And so you can um, extract this by sort of traditional means by computing some um, Witten diagram. It's very hard to see that. That's supposed to be a four point function with graviton exchange. And you can, if you compute such a diagram and expand it in blocks, then you can read off anomalous dimensions for this. And, and the methods for doing this have, have gotten a lot easier over the past 
um, year or two due to this nice inversion formula of Karen Huo. And so to do this, you, have to, you just have to compute some um, this double commutator and do some, some integration here and pick up some poles and so on. And when all is said and done, you can you do this calculation fairly efficiently and indeed you reproduce this um, formula for the anomalous dimension. Okay, so it all hangs together. But actually the Wilson line calculation was a lot easier, in fact, so that's nice. And here's what you get. So if you take that late time block and plot it, um, you get some, um, again, there's not so much physics in this because it's not in a black hole background, but nevertheless, you can see some familiar features here. So these are just one particular case. I've drawn this at different times. So at early times, you get striking this decay. And now this is the same picture, but expanded out to later times. And so things are coming back up again, oscillating. Now here at very late times, you can see some, um, this is actually a Poincaré recurrence here, coming back to the same value. And then you get this real oscillatory behavior. So there's some features of what you'd like to see in the more interesting case, but again, this is not, uh, this is not really telling you things about information loss. Um, okay, the other ways can be these nominal dimensions too from thermal partition functions, but I won't say anything about that. Um, okay, um, I believe my time is up. So the conclusion here is that these Wilson lines um, can be used to compute um, uh, various observables, including here anomalous um, dimensions and um, these conformal blocks at, at late times. And, and they seem to be a pretty efficient way of, um, of doing calculations. And um, in fact, a lot of the calculations here suggest a lot of simple structure that's not entirely understood. So one kind of hope or, or fantasy of mine is that um, eventually the system of you know, ADS3 gravity coupled to some um, particles will be in some, some sense, which I can't make precise, some sort of solvable system where you could actually compute exact quantities like these anomalous dimensions, which are very simple and sort of group theoretical disorder would perhaps extend to some exact uh, result at all orders in, in, in one over C and so forth. So that would be an um, interesting thing. Okay, thank you. In the talk before, we learned that uh, Wilson lines are dual to a two-point function in the CFT. And now you said that Wilson lines are dual to a VSO conformal block. So is one of these only an approximation? Yeah, the, the, the correct statement is there they compute uh, conformal blocks. They compute the various four conformal blocks. Now, if, the, if that one conformal block dominates the correlator, then of course you could say that's equal to the correlator. But the general statement is that the Wilson line is a, is a, is a, um, it's a represent, it's a, it computes a representation, it's a, you know, universal object, so it's computing, the general, natural, general thing is that it's computing the Vera Soro conformal block. That is the, that is the rigorous statement. I was wondering in the you know, context of this moonshine program, does the sequence 1, 6, 78, 12, 30 mean anything uh, at a deeper level? Yeah, I guess I should have um, typed that to one of the websites where you can find um, patterns. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Hi, it's kind of a similar question. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice, I'm kind of losing it. Um, you, you mentioned at some point that this uh, Wilson line encodes the vacuum block, but actually probably should, you should have a Wilson line in each representation that can do all of the higher blocks as well. It's not just the vacuum block, right? You just chose to have the vacuum block in that computation. That, that's right, so we should, when you do a full correlator, of course, actually computing, I certainly want to get a crossing symmetric correlator, for example, so that will force me in general to add in other blocks. So we can, in this, in this formalism, we can compute the other blocks as well, um, and then we can add them together. This doesn't really tell you how to add them together. You, did, you, you say I have to add them together to enforce crossing symmetry. That's essentially what you've learned. But I think what, one lesson that's come out of this, I think, is that it's, that's probably a needed step to really understand uh, black hole information paradox. It seems to be necessary to include more than the, 
the vacuum block, uh, that's what um, I believe the numerical results um, suggest. 